In this video, we're going to be looking at five CSS fouls. The first four are common mistakes that I see lots of beginners making and a lot of questions that come up and come to me are because of these types of mistakes they're making in their CSS. And the last one is something that from beginners all the way to experts, a lot of people are making this mistake and I want to make sure you're not making it in the sites you're creating. So let's go and see these five CSS fouls. Hi there, if you're new to this channel, my name is Kevin and here at my channel we learn how to make the web and how to make it look good while we're at it with weekly tips, tricks, and tutorials. And what are we waiting for? Let's jump into the very first foul, which is overly complicated selectors. And I see this all the time as people are learning how CSS works, they sort of push things a little bit and it makes sense why they do it, but it's something you really need to try and avoid doing. And it's something I'm a little bit guilty of as well. So we're gonna start with a basic example and then we're gonna look at one that's a bit more complicated that I actually did in a previous video of mine and how maybe I could have done it a little bit better. <laughs> Um, so the first thing is just looking at this, uh, which is a common way navigations will be styled and you see tutorials that are like this online all the time and there's a problem with it. These compound selectors are getting complicated for nothing. Now in the old days we had to worry about performance and the more like these compound selectors that were getting more and more uh, intense, they actually would have an effect on performance. These days the, per the effect is so small, it's really not a worry. It's just about making your CSS readable and super easy to understand and just simplifying life on everything. So um, there's really no reason on any of these that they need to be styled this way. Like my list items that are inside of my UL, my list items have to be in a UL anyway and they're in the nav. So you know the first thing I would do on something like this is I would take all of these out just to make my life a lot easier and make all of this a lot more organized. Because now I can see it's my nav link hover, my nav link, my nav list item, my nav UL. I don't have to read through it. So it's not something that's overly complicated to begin with, but why increase your cognitive load even by like a smidgen if you don't have to? Keep things as simple as possible. And if you really want to, uh, first off, I, I do see IDs used a lot. There's nothing wrong with using IDs. Uh, necessarily, but the same way that we're raising the specificity of something when we're using a these compound selectors, we're also doing it by uh, using IDs. There's nothing wrong with IDs. It's not really a foul, but you'll see lots of people don't recommend it. Um, in this case, I would have used just the nav element anyway, so we could just use our nav like this, or I might use a class on it. And if you really want to make things super readable in your CSS, it does take a little bit more work in your markup, but you could give all of these a class, and then I could have nav list. This could be my nav list item, and this could be a nav link. And then, of course, my nav link hover. Now, as I just said, it does mean you do have to go and actually give all of these a class in your markup, which you might find annoying and redundant a little bit, but it definitely does make your CSS a million times easier. So it's definitely one thing I do recommend to beginners and just anybody really is start giving more classes in general. It's like a little bonus one. I'm not even including that as a foul. Just use classes for everything. It does make your life a little bit easier, but um, I tend to do this for simple things. A little bit of compound selectors and nesting in your CSS I don't think is a big issue because it's still super easy to understand. Just don't go many levels deep. Um, the complicated one that I told you I would look at is something like this with my, this really complicated selector right here where we're looking at anything that has the attribute of checkbox type checkbox. So it pretty much means I'm selecting all my checkboxes. If it's checked, we want to select its sibling uh, we want to select a label only if it's an adjacent sibling. So this plus symbol means adjacent sibling selector. So a label that has an adjacent sibling that is a checkbox that is checked. And inside of that label, we're selecting the custom checkbox. And it's like, whoo, that's, that's a complicated selector. I had a good reason for doing this um, because I was doing a custom checkbox and custom checkboxes, you can't actually really style a checkbox. So I created a custom checkbox and I had it in a label. So the only way if I checked my actual checkbox to make this work, anyway, um, <laughs> you get the idea that it's a little bit of a complicated thing that I was up to. If you wanna see that video, you can check it out. Um, there should be a card popping up for it now. But basically uh, what I would do in this case is maybe a class on this would make my life a little bit easier. So if I, instead of done this, if I used class like checkbox, um, so my checkbox checked, I think makes a little bit more sense. Now this isn't complicated to begin with. So either way, um, I do think this would simplify things a little bit by using a class, but leaving it like this is, you know, I don't think it's the end of the world, but a comment here would really help. Now, when I did my video, I didn't put a comment cause I don't put a lot of comments cause I'm already explaining things orally, 
But if this was a production website, putting a comment here, if I'm coming back to my own project in three months, I don't want to find this selector and start having to look at it and study it a little bit. I mean, I could figure out what it's doing, but it's going to take me a few seconds to sort of analyze it. I don't want to have to do that. Or if somebody else is coming to this project, again, they might be able to analyze it or they might just be completely lost. So putting a comment here saying creates a check in my custom checkbox to replace the hidden actual checkbox. Something like that to explain what is happening here and what this is styling could be really, really useful. All right, on to foul number two, which is make sure your CSS is readable. Use MB space, guys. Um, I think now you might be going, I've never seen someone write CSS like this. This looks like a minified file almost, and it sort of is. I see a lot of beginners writing CSS like this. I teach in the classroom. I see my students doing this even though I explicitly tell them over and over and over again not to. And I've had people send me code asking for help on stuff and I can't read it because it looks like this and I have to run prettier on it to help format it properly so I can actually see what's going on a little bit better. I think the reason that beginners tend to write CSS like this sometimes is it looks really clean and that it's really easy to see your selector. Um, and it does look nice and clean. And at the beginning, when you're first writing CSS, you're not putting a lot of properties on something. You're doing something like background and padding and then you're moving on to the next thing because you don't know a lot about CSS yet. So when you only have two properties or three properties on something it's not super hard to be able to read this but even my ul here which only has four properties on it it you know i have to sort of analyze what i'm looking at a little bit more than i'd like to and then when i get to this like this is a, a nightmare i even have to side scroll to see everything that's on that you know so if you did this and then somebody you know somebody higher up or the client or whatever it is comes back and goes ah, we, we'd really like the underline to actually be on there you know i can find it i can read through and i can, I can find it in there but it's making your life more difficult than you have to. So there's no reason not to format it. And if you're looking for a job in this industry, start formatting your CSS properly. Um, so just coming through, and if you ever wanna work with other people and you're not doing this, it is a bit of a nightmare. So please, please come through, space things out. Don't be scared of empty space in your CSS. You wanna make it as readable as you can, um, but when you're writing it the first time, any text editor you're using, it's automatically going, you know, you don't have to worry about formatting it. It's already putting these tabs and everything in place for me as I'm writing my code, as long as I'm pushing return. It's not that much work to push return as you're writing some code. So take the time to put that empty space in your code and to format your CSS in a super readable way, because it's a lot easier to look at, oh, there's my selector, and then here's all the properties that are on there. The next foul is a very similar one than we just saw. It is staying organized with your CSS. And yes, spacing things out, this is part of being organized. But what I mean this time is use comments and group your things in ways that make sense. Because the amount of times I've seen people do this, and it's usually beginners that have smaller CSS files, so it's not that hard to find what you're looking for because you scroll up and down a little bit and there it is. But the amount of times I run into a style sheet that looks a little bit like this where it starts off well, I got my body, mage one, mage two, everything's looking good. There's my link styles, header. Oh, okay, now I have button styles. That That's, that's oh, section two. Wait, I have another button style here and okay, that's cool. Footer and then section. This is a really small file, but it, it's already a little bit confusing. Like why is section two in the middle of my buttons? Maybe the footer would make more sense after my section, but why is, you know, even I have footer, but then I have buttons and then I have my header all the way at the top. Try and keep things a little bit more organized. The way I tend to do it, A, is use comments. So here I would put uh, global styles, uh, sometimes even a really big comment something like this to do like different sectioning can be a really nice way just to break things apart and keep it really, really uh, nice and organized. And you just have to do it one time and then you've sort of created this thing that you can just copy and paste. So I have my global styles. I tend to put typography next, but if you have layout, that's fine. Type, uh, type typography. So H1, H2, my links can go in there and then I can come down into my layout. And in my layout, I would have my header, but I'm not gonna have my buttons. My section two would go in there. So I could take section two and bring that up into here. And then I'd come back down all the way to here and find these. And let's bring those up. And then I think it would make more sense for the global section one here to come before my section two. And then I have my buttons. So this is like layouts. Then I could come down into here and have like components, components. And inside my components, I could have my buttons and then they could have other sub uh, components as well. Your cards, other things could fall into like these subcategories. And if you want to be really organized, you could even come up and create a table of contents that has the order of things. 
And the cool thing with this is you're telling somebody all the stuff that's in your CSS file. So if I put one global styles, two typography, three components, and then I could even here put a 3.1 buttons, um, I would probably number them in here as well, but just to show you, if I do a search now for buttons, so I can do a find, run for buttons, it finds it there, and then I go for my next one, and it's going to bring me right to that section. And that's why numbering would be good too, because you might have classes or something that have it. Um, but if I want to find something, I just have to look at the table of contents, which is at the very top of my style sheet, and then run a search for that, and it's going to bring me exactly to that section. Not something I do in my videos usually, because I'm just running through and we're looking at specific things. But on a production site, if you're not using something like SAS or less, where you're building out partials, and you're sort of, your partials is almost like your table of contents, um, if you're just running off one big style sheet, I'd really recommend at least organizing it by group. And if you have a really big style sheet, creating a table of contents, or if you're working in a team, creating a table of contents can be a really good and really useful thing. On to file number four, it's when people don't refactor when it makes sense to refactor. And if you don't know about refactoring code, it's when you change code a little bit as you're working through it. And this is what I sort of did here when I reorganized this. Because sometimes you're working through something, you do your H1, your H2, you do a little bit of this, and then you need to make some buttons. So you start styling your buttons, and then you need to do some layout stuff, and then you need to do something else, and it gets really messy. So going through your code and reorganizing it a little bit as you're working, or at the end, once you've finished working, can be really useful. And the best time for me, I find when it makes sense, to refactors when things get messy, but also sometimes you're in the middle of writing something and you just realized you wrote the same really similar thing multiple times. So for example, um, when you're setting your font weights on things, sometimes you, you find you go font weight 900 and then you go, oh man, I need to put that same one here. So font weight 900. Okay, it's not that bad. You only, oh, I forgot. I also have my strong tag. I don't want that defaulting to 800. I really want it to be this black one, 900. Oh man, I'm repeating myself a lot here. So sometimes it seems longer in the long run to do this because you've already set it all up or you're in the middle of writing this and then you just realize that you're, you're doing the same thing over and over again. But coming up and taking the time to make this change, when you catch yourself repeating yourself over and over again and I can come through and put my font weight 900 all in one place. Because now, if I need to change it, I don't need to change it in three places. I can change it in one spot. Personally, when I have uh, selectors like this, where I'm selecting multiple elements with one selector, I tend to put that at the beginning, and then I run into all the individual selectors after that. It will help you out in the long run, even though it might seem like a little bit more work at the time when you're creating something like this. So I'd really encourage you to take the time of doing that when you catch yourself writing the same code over and over and over again. And on to file number five. I'm going to switch over. To, um, so this is from a Another video that I did where I was looking at um, change where, where I was looking at how we can change the background color and the navigation when we scroll if you want to see that video there should be a card popping up for it now but what I want to look at is what people do is they remove the outline from items now this is also common in forms um, so if you don't know what outline is it's I'm sure you've seen it when you tab through a page and you can see that it is highlighting it with this blue glowy box and people don't like this blue glowy box. They get annoyed by it. I find on links, it doesn't look that bad, but you can see when you get onto buttons, if you've rounded the buttons on there, it doesn't look super nice. But isn't that really useful to know what I'm on? Um, so what people do is they come through and they'll give a focus of outline none. So they're removing the outline from their page. Now the problem with this is, let's refresh this page. So now we have, uh, there's no outline on it. So if I came onto this page and I were to click through and I'm tabbing right now, I don't know what's selected. And maybe you don't use tab to navigate a website. I use it on forums all the time. And sometimes I will use it to go through links really fast on a web page. So this is for any link whatsoever. By default, there is that outline on it. Now, while most people might be using a mouse or their you know, phones are really popular now, so outline isn't, you know, if you're on a phone or tablet, the outline might not be as important, but there are still lots of people who navigate pages using a keyboard, whether they're disabled in one way or another, or if they just prefer to navigate a website like that. So now that I'm pushing tab on here, I have literally no idea what's selected. I, I'm pushing it, there's nothing showing up. If you don't like the default outline, that's fine. But one thing you should know, and you might not know is let's remove this 
and I'm going to save that. Um, if we look at it in Firefox, so here's Firefox, the default outline is actually different from Chrome, and which is all the WebKit um, browsers. So I'm guessing that Edge is there now and Safari is the blue glow, whereas uh, Firefox and other browsers, they might look a little bit different. There's nothing wrong with styling a focus state, and this focus could be anything you want but always style your focus state. So you could remove outline none. You could say, I don't want an outline, but I'm going to do something else. If you So you could start off by saying, everything has no outline on it. I'm gonna remove my outline from anything that gains focus. If you do this though, you have to make sure that you're going through and you're actually adding in a focus state back to things. So if we're looking at these here with this underline, I created that on the hover, but I didn't include it on my focus. So we can come down here, here is my hover state for it. So I could take that exact same thing that I created here and put it in, but also put it for my focus state. Uh, don't forget the comma when you're doing this. So we have our two different selectors. And when I do that, when I refresh here, if I come through on these, you can see as I tab through there, it is actually highlighting it and shift tab and you can always go backwards. So I'm getting this nice focus state. Same thing on my buttons. Now, if I tab again, it doesn't, I'm on selected this login button, but there's no visual indication of that. Who knows where I am? So I'd wanna come on these buttons. I have my hover. I wanna take the exact same selector and just come through and add it on the focus as well. Now your focus and your hover do not have to be the same. You can style them differently if you want to, but the simplest solution is to do them both. So now you can see when I tab onto that, it, it looks like it's selected and I can do the same thing on all my buttons. I can do it on my links. You can make things look more bold. I'm actually gonna put a link in the description to this that's going to the Ally project and sort of the recommendations on it. So their main thing is if you are removing a outline from the focus, just first of all, you shouldn't do it. But if you do think it would look better or you're going to do it, find ways that make it really obvious that that item is selected right now. You don't wanna just turn off this outline and it is something that has been a big problem on the web for a long time. Do not do it. And one of the big advantages of doing it this way also, it is going to be consistent in Chrome or in Firefox now. So I'm back in Chrome now. If I go through on here, you can see I'm getting the exact same experience in both of them. So if that is something that's important to you and trying to keep similarity between your browsers, giving your own focus states is one way you can do that. And that is it, except wait, no, it isn't. I'm gonna give you a little bonus now for all of you who stuck around until the end. And this is less of a foul when it comes to uh, CSS necessarily. It's more of just a design one, whereas, well, I guess the last one was a CSS file, but in terms of accessibility, this one is also in terms of accessibility, but this is like literally just a design foul, um, which is, make sure your contrast isn't too low. Um, you'll see lots of websites. If you go to like Theme Forest or something like this, uh, you'll see a lot of places that create these really nice layouts. And one of the things they do is the contrast ratio on some of the text is really light. You can see here, this is giving me a warning. And this is with Chrome, you don't have this in Firefox. And in general, I prefer Firefox's dev tools, but in Chrome, if you open up your inspector and you use this little hand thing, um, you can get this contrast ratio, which is amazing. So you can see here, I'm getting a check mark. My contrast is high enough, here it is not high enough. So just make sure you're going through and finding numbers that are high enough. You definitely don't have to have your paragraphs the same color as your headings, and even I would discourage it, um, but just make sure that even if they are a different color, that you're getting a nice little check mark here on your contrast ratio. It makes sure that a lot of people can read it, because you might be young, you might have amazing eyes, other people out there are getting older like me, it's not always super, you go with a really small font size and with this really low contrast ratio and it makes it really hard to read. I find on white people don't make this mistake too much, but on dark backgrounds, my goodness, some people go with really dark text as well and it becomes really hard to read. So check out that contrast ratio, make sure that it's high enough because you wanna make sure everybody can read your content. So that is it for this video. I hope you liked it. If you're new here and you haven't yet subscribed and you did enjoy it, please consider hitting that subscribe button and getting weekly videos just like this one. Are there any fouls or things that you see people doing in their CSS that are clearly bad practice, please leave a comment down below and let me know the ones that irk you the most. I thank you very much to my patrons for helping support everything I do here on my channel and making everything I do here possible. You guys are amazing. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, don't forget to make your corner on the internet just a little bit more awesome.